I'm delighted to welcome you back to our digital series and equitable recovery. Today's guest is Baroness Camilla Cavendish of Little Italy. A lot of those people also work in our health service and they work in social care and they are looking after some of the most needy and vulnerable people in our society. And the public has seen those people and admires those people and thinks, yes. wow, we need to do something about it. Now, one difference between our societies, as you know, is that we have a free, at the point of view, healthcare system. I was going to come to that. We have universal access to our healthcare system, and that is a phenomenal bonding thing for our society. It's something that we are all proud of on every part of the political spectrum. And in fact, we've had a thing here where every Thursday night, during the lockdown yes. in Britain, people came out of their houses and clapped yeah. for the NHS and banged saucepans at eight o'clock. Say not. Now it sounds a bit trite, but it was a real expression of something of solidarity in our but it's not, community. But it's not trite, Baroness. Um, I've been a proponent of, of of some form of national self service in the U.S. because one of the things that became apparent to me during the COVID nineteen pandemic was people weren't getting tested because they didn't have coverage, right? And the cost of the test was passed on to those who didn't have the resources to pay for it. And therefore, they refused to go, right? And I think, I think Lord Beveridge's jewel in the crown, as you know very, very well, the International Health Service has been a savior, to be honest with you, in the UK, because it's, it provided not just that access to health care, but it provided a certain level of emotional security, right? nobody was worried about gaining access. There was no multiple layers to go through uh, before you went to the hospital to decide, can I go in because I have no insurance, right? So, so, so that aspect of your society is one that I've always argued was lacking in ours. And I saw, I saw all those Thursday evening um, events where people were clapping on the streets from, from Prince William down to the guy on Labrick Grove, right? All acknowledge, acknowledging uh, the wonderful work and the sacrifice of frontline healthcare employees. And that to me helps to build community because everybody's paying in. Uh, and by paying in, you have a certain sense of ownership, a certain sense of pride, and a certain type of respect for professionals who put themselves in harm's way in service to the public. So I'm a big fan of the NHS, and I think that helped to carry the nation through. If I can pivot slightly um, to the notion of workforce, which we haven't really discussed much today, because one of the things that came up um, in the US was an acknowledgement that certain kinds of jobs will not come back certain kinds of professions will shrink. And that in many ways, COVID-19 has accelerated our journey into the future, where people are now dependent on their laptops, they need broadband coverage, and they will be occupying jobs that may re require them to be remote. What lessons, if any, have you observed from what's happened in the UK that might be applicable to the very same uh, trends that will be occurring in the US in the foreseeable future? I think one of the hopeful things I would say is that we're all worried about automation. We've all been told that all of our jobs are going to be taken away by robots. And actually, the research I did for my book I discovered that in fact, we've got skills shortages. So wow. the robots are coming in, but we're running out of humans and we're running out of humans because we're getting older and our birth rate is falling. So funnily enough, there are still a lot of companies which have skill shortages. And the key is to make sure that we can skill our populations to fill the jobs that are available. Now in COVID, as you said, we've accelerated the move to digital we lost a lot of hospitality, catering, hotel jobs. But equally, we're probably going to create quite a lot of other jobs. And some of this, I think, is about EQ versus IQ. So 
a lot of the jobs that AI can do brilliantly are what we used to call IQ. If a doctor is diagnosing you, you know, he's highly trained, he's highly paid to diagnose your disease. Now, the truth is we now know that AI can do that better than the doctor. So what happens to the doctor's role? Well, the doctor's role has got to be much more about the bedside manner, making you feel confident, explaining to you the probabilities that the AI diagnosis has just given you and what that means and taking you on the journey of treatment. But it's much more about EQ than IQ. And I think we're going to see this all the way down the chain. I think care workers, people look after elderly people, people who are human and have the EQ that robots can't provide are going to become more valuable. But we don't train people in that. So I think this yes. is a challenge to the training industry fundamentally. Yes. I mean, Singapore has an amazing lifelong learning program. It's the best in the world. It's called Skills Future. Every citizen of Singapore has a voucher which they can use at any time in their life for a series of approved courses. I will also add, I will also add Baroness, that Singapore has one of the highest uh, investment per GDP of any country in the world for workforce investment. And they also have, you know, they, they pay their teachers a lot of money. And I mean, they, they have a very interesting model. But what they are seeing is that careers are going to change. There's no job for life. People are going to work longer and people need purpose. So we have a lot of debate in our side of the pond about something called universal basic income. The idea is, look, all the jobs are going to go. We basically better pay people you know, every citizen a certain amount of money to, to cushion them because all the jobs are going to go. Now, actually, the only the problem with that argument, apart from that it's very expensive, is that it's telling people you don't really need a job. But purpose, wow. having a sense of purpose to me is fundamental to dignity, to your everybody yes. deserves to have a sense of purpose. And we know that having a sense of purpose is highly correlated with your health outcomes. So how are we going to give people that sense of purpose in the future? Can we give them the skills to get the jobs that are there? Can we get them to help solve some of the social problems that we've got in our societies? One of the things we're not utilizing, in my view, is all these older people in extra time yes. who have too much time on their hands could be solving social problems. A lot of them do when they get involved. They help mentor kids. They help create new organizations. I mean, Entrepreneurs nowadays are actually in their 50s creating more jobs than entrepreneurs in their 30s. We have a whole rash of new people on the block who are creating new businesses and they're creating answers to social problems. And that energy doesn't kind of run out at any particular age. So I'm quite hopeful about that as long as we have a broad view of what purpose means and what worth, worth means in our societies. You know, uh, Baroness, um, purpose and value also translates into economic activity, as you know. Uh, there's something called the silver economy in Europe, which we talked about briefly. And today, um, Europeans uh, that are of the age of 60 and over contribute around $3.3 trillion dollars to economic activity in the European Union. By 2030, that would become 5.3 trillion. So, and, and, and by itself, the European silver economy would be in the top 10 largest economy in the world. In, in the US, um, Professor Joseph Coughlin over at MIT has written a book called Longevity Economy, which I'm sure you've heard about. And in his book, he talked about America as being, uh, Americans who are 50 and over contribute something like $8.3 trillion to economic activity and represents around 40% of GDP. So older Europeans and older Americans are contributing tremendous value and measurable value to the economy through their, to, through their spending and through the jobs that are dependent on them and through other means. And yet, as societies, we're not age-friendly, as you know. And so my question is, given that we are, we are an aging economy that will become more dependent on the economic activities generated by older people, 
And, in the, and also in the U.S., by 2024, the largest single segment of the workforce will be Americans with 50 and over. So how do we integrate um, aging into an economy that will become dependent on aging? Can you speak a little bit to that, please? Two of the jobs that are done by older people are nursing and farming. Surprisingly enough, there are the, a huge number of people in their 50s who are doing nursing and farming in the US and the UK. And if those people all retire tomorrow, we are in huge, huge trouble. We have to reinvent what we think of as the career timetable. We all have, I think, still in our head, you know, you kind of make it in your thirties and that's when you get onto the partner track and the big corporation kind of yes. identifies you. The irony of that is that that's when a lot of us are having children. I mean, I have three children and it was quite hard to keep my foot on the gas in my yes. career while having the children. So we push it all into that window of time. Then we have in our heads, well, you know, in 50, you start to peter out and at 60, you disappear. And, and because we have that in our head, we, some of us start to psychologically give out that signal to the employer. So at oh. 50, we're sort of, there's a lot of research on this. We're thinking, well, I guess I've only got a few more years left. The employer is thinking, yeah, how am I going to gracefully, you know, move this person out? Now, to change that, what I've argued for is something called a midlife MOT, which is like a car servicing in the local garage here, yeah. where you go in and you say, right, you know, let's look at my finances, let's look at my health, let's start planning the next phase of my life, and let's say to my employer, I'm really committed, and I'm committed for the next 20 years, let's talk about how we're going to work together. And actually, those conversations can be extremely productive, because nobody talks about this stuff this is all under the radar you know you're all it's all inside your head and then suddenly one day you realize you haven't got a job anymore and yes. that is that is an enormous problem especially for people in lower income and lower skill brackets because the people at the very top of the tree with lots of degrees they're not finding it hard at all they're coming back they're still teaching at harvard at 70 they're coming back into the workforce as consultants at 60. it's the people you talked about it's the woman on the reception desk and it's the security guard, those people are finding they cannot get back into the job market yes. after you're 50. And if we don't fix that, then we have a major problem because those people don't have any savings to rely on. So that's why I'm saying we all have a job to shift this concept of the career timetable. And what a lot of people are doing now is something called bridge jobs. You know, they're not necessarily staying in their job. They're moving sideways. They're moving into something slightly different. They don't have to keep going upwards. So there's a fear that as you get older, you'll get more expensive. And a lot of employers advertise for dynamic people or they like to imply, they're not allowed to say young anymore in this country because we have age discrimination law, but they, they imply it. They say, you've got to be tech savvy. You've got to be dynamic. What they actually mean is you've got to be cheap because the older you get, the more expensive you get, particularly yes. when you have insurance as you do in the States with healthcare. And those of us who are getting a bit older have to make sure that we start to think about how are we gonna move sideways? Because we can't just keep expecting to get paid more and more and more, we're gonna price ourselves out of the market. So we have to change our concept of the timetable, the career timetable, and we have to change our concept of, of seniority and pay. And I think if we can do those two things, it will be easier for employers to see, oh, wow, you know, he's got 30 years experience. He's really well liked. He's really good at managing conflict. I'm going to keep him. And what all the research tells you about multi-generational teams is that yes. it can create conflict because people have very fixed views about what is appropriate at different ages. And they don't like the guy who's 60 being given an IT job. And they don't like the guy who's 30 getting a sudden promotion too fast. But yes. if we change that, the research on teams shows that the, some of the most productive teams are where you mix the old people and the young people. And to simplify, the young people bring ideas and dynamism and optimism and all that, and they learn very fast. Older people apparently are better at managing conflict. They're more loyal. They're more likely to stick with the organization. And, and actually, if you work it together, it, it improves productivity. But it's a real challenge for management 
because yes. we're not used to managing multiple generations under one roof and that's where we're heading i mean four generations under one roof quite possibly that's a good point and i as you're talking i'm also thinking about your experiences in researching extra time because you were able to see so many different approaches to aging in so many different locations, countries, societies, cultures. If you were to say one country has this down, right? All right, where would you where could we find that? There's, there's no silver bullet. I was looking for the silver bullet. I thought you couldn't find it. I thought the US was the best. I started out because my mother was American and I think America has such a can-do spirit, such a positive attitude. There are all people in America and they just keep going and your universities and your law courts are full of superannuated academics and judges who are still brilliant at 80, right? And the yes. UK is not like that. So I started out in America. Then I realized that you don't have all the answers. And I went to many other countries. The one I would single out as having many answers is Japan, which oh. is the world's oldest society. So they, have, they are ahead of all of us. And they have done a number of things right. So one of the things they've done right is that they have something called Silver Centers, which is a network throughout the country which finds part-time work for older people. And the oldest person wow. I met was 101. And there are people, you know, doing beautiful calligraphy for businesses and there are people helping children in playgrounds and looking after parks. But all the jobs are real jobs and they are jobs that add real value to the economy. And those groups in themselves are forming communities. So it's a combination of economy and community. They do that very well. They also have a social insurance system, which means that everybody pays in but everybody also knows that later on when they get old, they will be properly looked after. And it's a very subtle and complicated system. The Germans have also built it, but it gives you that security, that emotional security that you talked about earlier, which is so fundamental to our fundamental well-being. And the last thing the Japanese have is a concept of ikigai, which is their philosophy of reason for being. And everything they do through this philosophy is not just about making money it's about who are you really what is your real contribution to society and what gets you up in the morning and they are still thinking about that through all the years of their lives and it's very very powerful you know baroness cavendish I, I the book for me came at just the right time uh because like like you uh, and many of us We've had three or four months to reflect, often, often reflect in solitude, uh, sometimes of too much time on our hands, because like you, I spent much of my time in airplanes and in hotel rooms. And so the period of reflection gives you a chance to be somewhat introspective. And you think more about yourself. You think more about those around you. And you think also about the kind of society that you'd like, would, would, I would like us to become as a result of this um, shutdown. As you reflect on the last few months and have written extra time, do you have a renewed sense of optimism, particularly around aging, that somehow we have learned a few lessons here that will help us become better societies? COVID-19 has done is it, it threatened to separate the generations, didn't it? Because we know that COVID is far more dangerous over 70 than under 70. And there's been a real danger all the way through that the younger generation would say, this is not our problem. We want to just keep going with our lives. You older people should shut yourselves away. And that has not happened. In fact, the surveys show that older people are actually far less worried about getting this virus than some younger people. So there's a lot of older people I know who are just saying, look, you know, I haven't got much longer. I want to see my family. I'm just going to get on. And they're the ones, funnily enough, who are volunteering. They're taking the shopping to other people because they don't regard themselves as old. Yeah. So I think, funnily enough, it's brought the generations together when, it, when that was very unexpected. And, a lot of people in our country who've been prevented from seeing granny have really missed granny and have noticed that granny has a huge impact 
That's I mean, wonderful. in our country, many, many grandparents pick their children up from school. They're the, they're the backbone of our society. They're the reason we can go to work as working parents. And when granny has had to go away and, and shield herself at home, that's been actually very difficult for a lot of families. So I think, I think we have got a stronger sense of community, partly because of the isolation that you talked about. We are social beings. 